Praise the Lord. Let's pray. May we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for such a wonderful time, day. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. We thank you for bringing us in your house for one reason, to Father, serve Jesus. We want to hear the voice of our Lord and Savior through this such scripture today and every other activity they were going to carry out today in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for us that are here and those who are on their way, you quicken their steps. And Father, Holy Spirit of God, we ask that you'll help us to hear, give us a hearing ear, a receptive heart to receive with gladness and joy. And Father, a memory to remember that which you're going to learn today, that God will be able to apply that which you want us to apply today. There is going to be deliverance today as we learn about the exodus of your children and the Passover. I pray, my Father, there will going to be deliverance in every area that the enemy has further put bondage in our lives. Start with me, O oh God. Touch everyone, touch every life. Sweet Spirit of the living God, we ask that you take absolute control. I hide behind the cross that you may be heard through me and your people in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, we bless you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Our such a scripture topic today is lesson 44. And uh, this, the topic is Passover and Israel Exodus. Passover and Israel's Exodus. Our last, um, our memory is coming from the book of Exodus chapter. The text, first, first of all, you have two chapters. One of them is very long. The first one, chapter 12. The next one is, is chapter 12, verse 1 to 51. The second one is chapter 13, verse 1 to 22. Because of time, we're just going to go into different uh, pick, uh, particular script, uh, scriptures to read to accompany us on this journey, on this particular topic today. Before we begin on our next topic, on our topic for today, I want somebody to give us a recap of what we learned last week. Last week, the judgment, about the judgment in Egypt. Can somebody give us a recap of what we learned? If we can remember, so we can carry on. We've been on a series of exodus about the children of Israel, how they were in bondage, judgment came, and now we are on the Passover and their exit out of Egypt. Can you give us a recap real quick? We don't have much time. Anybody that can remember? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, basically, what we studied last week was um, uh, Pharaoh's stubbornness and the judgment that followed as a result of those stubbornness. That is to say, the, the templates that God unleashed on uh, Pharaoh and the people of Egypt as a result of the stubbornness of their king and following the cry of the people of the children of Israel concerning their burden in Egypt. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, and so what we learned from what uh, Brother Vincent has said is that, you know, from what we learn, the lesson that we learn from Pharaoh's hardness of heart is that, that, is that a God is not willing that any should perish. He's willing that every one of us should come to repentance. That, so those who choose to remain in their sins or in their wicked ways will be judged and will, per, will perish in hell. But those who answer the call of God unto salvation will receive pardon and deliverance from the judgment that is, is, is going to come at the end of this life. I pray that all of us, as we hear the word, God will help us for those of us who need to make their ways right and to give their lives to Christ. We'll heed that voice and do the right thing. Praise the Lord. Now, today, we're going to, I wanted us to read, somebody, a quick reader, to read, uh, uh, not Genesis, but Exodus chapter 12. Just read maybe from verse 1 to 14. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 14. Exodus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. 
And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast it with fire and, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sudden out at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs and with the puritans thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in, in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. So now, uh, as we read from, that, from chapter 12, from verse 1 to 14, just a summary of, of what was going on. So uh, God sends Moses. He tells Moses, go and communicate a message unto my people, the Israelites. God is getting ready to exit them, to get them out of the bondage they were in for 430 years. Moses communicated the message that would release the Israelites from their protracted, mean long lasting. The, the, the bondage was for a long time. 430 years is not a, long, it's not a short time. And in Egypt, so the Lord instructed them to sprinkle the blood of the slain lamb on their doorpost of their houses so that they could be identified for sparing while the human, God was planning to do, you know, there's been judgment from the last topic. There were 10 plagues, and then now the last one is coming, and Pharaoh is still just thinking, you know, playing his game, he's still puffing up his pride and his, you know, uh, stubbornness. He's still, you know, puffing up. He doesn't know the plan that God has. He thinks it's gonna be the same game that he's been playing for the past 10, and nine or 10 plagues now. God is, you know, telling Moses, go tell my people that they need to do something. They need to get a lamp, and they need to slay in this lamb and use the blood that is coming out of this lamb to, sp to sprinkle on their doorpost. And when I'm going my, past my judgment, which is going to be death, to consume the lives of the firstborns, every firstborn in Egypt, both humans and animals. I was surprised I say even animals, you know. Both humans and animals. I'm going to, when I see the blood, I will pass over those that have the blood on their door, which means if the Israel did not heed their voice, or some did heed and some did not, those who did not might have not been saved. So Moses passes the message, and the children of Israel are going, did the same, the, the exact instruction that he, they were given now. God gave instruction on, on the, what kind, the particular qualification of that kind of what the lamb was supposed to be. It was not just going to be any kind of a lamb. It was, he was not just going to let them see, you know, just pick any. So God gave the instruction. He said, this lamb must be without blemish. I want to read Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. And he says, your lamb shall be without blemish. It has to be a male of the first year, which means that lamb should be at least one year, not more than a year, young like that. So I need that kind of a lamb, a lamb that is without blemish, a male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. It could be from the sheep, it could be a goat that is about a year or not more than a year. It could be a, a, lamb, a, go, a lamb or I mean a sheep or a, a goat. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Praise the Lord. So the, the qualification of the lamb that it was required to be a sacrifice was a lamb without blemish. It had to be a male that is at least a year old, not older. Not, not older than one year. And the lamb was to be roasted and eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, which this foreshadowed. The unleavened bread and bitter herbs that they were supposed to use to eat, to eat with this lamb, is a foreshadow of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ as a Paschal lamb on the cross of Calvary. It was like, it was, 
something that was supposed to come. God was doing this ahead, like to show what was going to come. So the Passover was given as a sign of his shed, shed blood for the remission of our sins. His sinless body, which provides life for believers and the bitter suffering and death that he endured to bear our grief and sorrows. Now, remember the, the lamb is supposed to die without blemish. Now, when you look at it on the other aspect of the New Testament, of our Christ dying on the cross for us, Christ was without blemish. This way we are finding this word is saying his sinless body. So it's, it's, God, God, Jesus Christ did not have sin. He never sinned, but he was, that's why he was chosen to be that lamb to go ahead and qualified to take our sin upon himself. And living bread meant sin in our in a spiritual, uh, um, the spiritual aspect of it as for now, as we can see and understand is that unleavened bread represents sin in us Christians' life. Spiritual interpretation is in our lives is that is sin. So God wanted the, the lamb to be without any issue, no, you know, nothing that could prevent the sacrifice to be, to qualify for what God wanted to be. I want us to read the book of Isaiah, a book of Colossians chapter, if anybody can quickly open the book of First Corinthians chapter 1, another person, First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, 6 to 8, and another one, First Corinthians chapter 3, we're in a class, as Sister Mijo always say, First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, verse 6 to 8. Another person, Colossians 3. Which one do you have, Sister Vivian? Okay, go ahead. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Your mm -hmm. glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth, leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Praise, Praise the Lord. Colossians 3, I'll explain both of them. They are kind of similar in a way God is talking about putting away all of our sin, all of our wicked things that defile us. Colossians 3, chapter 5, verse 6. Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 5. Five and six. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Praise the Lord. So, First uh, Corinthians chapter five, verse six to eight, is telling us that your glory is not good. No, ye not that a little leaven leaveneth. The whole lamp. Every any small sin, there is no sin that is not small. Any sin, however small, however medium, however big it is, it defiles somebody. It defiles us as Christian. So God is also uh, is telling us on these scriptures that you know, as the lamp was supposed to be without blemish, as the lamp was supposed to be a perfect lamp. So if we look at it as this, the Passover lamb that was slain during the the Passover time for the Israelites. And comparing to Jesus being a foreshadow of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ was, was without sin. And we are being admonished today that as Christians, that we are supposed to live a life, a life that is sinless, life that is without sin. And even if you look at, the, uh, as they were told, this, uh, the, the bread has to be eaten with, the, the lamb was to be roasted and eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So unleavened bread means it was without default, without any corrupt, cor it was not corrupted. Now, when you look at it on our New Testament, when you're talking about the Passover, which is the Lord's Supper that we take, I think we take it four or five, four quarterly in the church. But in our own home, some of us do have it, and we take it, some take it on a weekly basis, like on women prayer line, we do have it. So we are always required that when you're getting ready to take that, uh, that Passover lamb of, of Lord Jesus, the Lord's Supper, we are supposed to look into ourselves, examine yourself, see if there's any sin in you. And we have scripture that we normally read from the First Corinthians that you've always given us, even when Pastor Victor or Pastor, one of the pastors stand here to you know, shower us into taking it. They are always reminded, if you, it, if you have any sin in you, leave everything in, in the altar and go and make right. If your ways, if you wrong somebody, if you have any sin, talk to your God and ask God to forgive you. So we are supposed to partake of this Lord's Supper also, just like the Israelites were instructed to make sure there was no sin, there was no unleavened in them, which is uh, an indication of, of sin in their lives. 
the instructions on the observance and the purpose of the Passover. Instructions on the observance. Moses was sent to Pharaoh with heavy tidings. And I want to read the book of uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 to 24. So our main point over there about the Passover during the Moses time, the Exodus time, is about unleavened, unleavened bread, with the bread that without blemish, not sin. As in our time today, New Testament, about the Lord's Supper is that we are supposed to be always ready. We are supposed to purge ourselves, purge every iniquity in our lives, every sin, every besetting sin that we have in our lives. We need to examine ourselves and be very careful. We can't just take the Lord's Supper when we are full of sin and, and you know, because the Bible tells us, if we read the, that first Corinthians, they, there's a lot of instruction in it that that's why some of us, they don't, they die. Some of us fall sick because sometimes we are corrupt within ourselves, but then we don't make ourselves right with God and we just go ahead and take this, uh, the Lord's Supper. Praise the Lord. Now I want to read the book of Exodus to see the, the instruction that was given. Instruction of the observance and the, and the past pause of the Passover. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 to 24, and I will read it. I don't know why I keep going into Genesis. Exodus chapter 12, I will read verse 21 to 24, and let's see the instruction that was given unto the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 to 24, and I read. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. And, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when, they, when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the door side post, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Verse 24. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance for thee and to thy sons forever. Praise the Lord. That was the instruction, what they needed to do how to slay the lamb and what to do with the blood, put it on the doorpost. And at verse 24, said that it's not, they were not just going to do it once and forget about it. They are going to carry on with this uh, celebration. Every year they were supposed to be remembering and telling their children what the Lord did for them, how the Lord brought them out of Egypt from bondage. It was not something that was supposed to be. So Moses sent, was sent to Pharaoh with heavy tidings that would judge his disrespect of God's command. You know, God sent Moses many times without going with Heron, talking to, uh, you know, trying to plead with him so he could let his people go, so Mo Pharaoh could let God's people go. He was also sent to, but Pharaoh never heard the voice or the, or the warning or, the, or, or, or the, the message that was being sent to him by uh, Moses, uh, by God through Moses. He, Moses was also sent to the Israelites with divine counsel on what to do now about this Passover exodus uh, to, for them to move, uh, get out of the Egypt. Before God was sending Moses to Pharaoh, different times, Pharaoh refused to heed the voice of God. Now, the last time that God wants to strike and want to show Pharaoh that he is God, he's not a joke, he's now sending Moses and telling Moses, go tell my people, because I want to save them, go tell them to do this and so. He was also sent to Israelites with divine counsels on what to do in order to enjoy the promised blessings of God. And Moses, like other faithful servants of God, faithfully delivered God's message on how they were, were to observe the first Passover in Egypt. And I read Exodus chapter 20, 12, 21, and 22. He also instructed them also on how, because verse 22 on Exodus chapter 12, telling that they should observe this ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. So the first time, that the beginning that it was being instituted was what you are learning right now. Then God told them, don't just do it once. But afterwards, even wherever you're going, do continue remembering, continue celebrating this thing in remembrance for what I did for you in Egypt. Now, the lesson we learn from here is that, like the Israelites, may God give us the grace to obey his word and his instructions. Praise the Lord. The Israelites were instructed by God through Moses. They hear the voice of God. They say, yes, we'll do it. And they follow the example, the precept, every step of it. And they did what they were told to do. Another lesson we are learning is that 
May we always share our testimonies on how God delivered us from the bondages we once found ourselves in. God delivered the children of Israel from the bondage of slavery for 140, 30 years. I pray that God will help us to remember where God brought us from. We were deep in sin. God pulled us out of sin, washed us with his blood, which we are celebrating every single day. We celebrate the resurrection, the death of Christ, the bitter death of Jesus Christ, the suffering that he suffered for us. And now we have liberty to serve him as true children of God. May we, also, may we never, st never stop to preach the gospel for the salvation of sinners. You know, Moses was sent, and he delivered the message. He was sent starting with Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He was sent to the children of Israel, and they heed the voice of God, and they received their deliverance. There are so many people that are suffering out, our families, our workmates, our neighbors in the society, in the nation. But the people that we are around with, that we are supposed to reach out to them and preach the gospel. I pray God will give us the grace and the remembrance that we were just like them and that God has saved us first not to sit with that salvation, not to hold it on ourselves, but to also come out as we give our testimony, as we share the love of God and bring them to, sal to be saved in the mighty name of Jesus. Because God is not wishing that any should perish and God has mandated us as Christians to go forth and do so. Praise the Lord. Another lesson is that may we, our hearts not be hardened like Pharaoh's heart, and may our ears not be deaf to hear God's warning, to hear God's command, and to hear God's instruction. Pharaoh was hardened in heart. And because of that, to the very last minute, he caused a whole group of people, firstborns, male, men, and animals in the land to die. May God give us, may God help us not to harden our hearts that we will always have a heart that is soft to hear and obey God and to do his instruction and his command in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. We have some examples of men in the Bible that also are like Pharaoh. We have a few. We just have two that we are going to talk about. One of them was Eli. Another one was Nebuchadnezzar. We know the story of Eli. It was very sad when he heard that, you know, he let his children bring reproach to the house in the name of God. Eli became reluctant. He became complacent with his position, and he just watched everything go wrong as a leader. I pray God will give our leaders in the church, our leaders in our homes, our leaders in the society and in the nation, to know the position that God has placed them in and ask for the grace, especially for Christians, that God will give them the grace because no man can do anything perfectly without the grace of God. That God will help our leaders, our men, like I said, in our church, in our homes, in our society and in our nation. Pharaoh was a leader of a nation, and he let the nation down. We continue to pray for our nations as we pray all the time that God will remember our nations all over the world, that our leaders will have the fear of God and that God will help them to lead the nations in the way of the Lord so the nation will not suffer the consequences of their weaknesses in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. So Eli was like Pharaoh. Nebuchadnezzar was also like Pharaoh. When God sent um, a warning unto Eli, what did Eli say? He said, as it pleases God, let him do so. He didn't get broken in his heart to make his ways right. He didn't warn his children, and as a result of it, he himself and his children perished. It will not be so unto us in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar was proud, full of himself, and he thought he owned everything. thought everything that God gave him, he did it. And God turned him to animal, and he was in the grass eating the grass like animals. I pray we'll not go to that extent where we forget so much and we become too proud and become too complacent and miss out on the blessing of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. So the purpose of the Passover, let me read the book of Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. I remember when I was studying yesterday, I gave this proverb, I remember, I remember Pastor Victor. He liked to quote this scripture a lot, that he that honeyed his heart. Praise the Lord. And it makes sense because when we keep hardening our hearts, whether we are leaders, whether we are adults, whether we are children or our youth, anybody, this could affect. We get destroyed. We will be destroyed. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 29. 29 verse 1. And this applies to Pharaoh, applies to Eli, it applies to Nebuchadnezzar. How many of us have keep hardening their hearts? The Lord is calling us today. If you keep hardening, I read it. Proverbs chapter 29. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, 
shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Praise the Lord. Pharaoh did the same thing. Every time he's being sent, plague is coming. He doesn't care. He comes on and goes. Finally, he was destroyed. And that was actually a shame for a leader for allow situations like that to take place. I believe he was ashamed, but it was too late. God gave him many, God gave him many chances that he played around with, and it was messed. Let me go to our first question real quick before I proceed. What sacrifice did God ask the Israelites to make before they left Egypt? What sacrifice did God ask the Israelites to make before they left Egypt? Pastor Eze. And, uh, and place the blood at the doorposts of their houses to avert God's judgment. Praise the Lord. Question number two, relate the lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs used for the Passover with Christ. Relate the lamb, the unleavened bread, and bitter herbs used for the Passover with Christ. Praise the Lord. The, pray, amen. The Passover lamb is a type of Christ because he was, Christ was sinless just as the lamb was spotless and uh, the unleavened bread uh, was a uh, symbol too of sinlessness it was a, sin, a, a symbol of sin uh, uh, you know uh, sinlessness in, in the body of Christ and then the bitter herbs and uh, that was eating with it was um, the painful and bitter experience of Christ at the cross. Praise the, the Lord. death he passed through for us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So we also want to see the purpose. Why? What was the purpose for this Passover? So the purpose for the Passover that was for God was for God to deliver the Israelites from the land of Egypt, from the bondage of the 400 years of slavery. So God manifested himself unto the Egyptians as the judge through the act of slaying the firstborns, which, which caused the stubborn and proud Pharaoh to order immediate release of the Israelites in total submission to the supremacy of God's power over his creature. And stubbornness came to an end. Pharaoh realized that this God is a powerful God and is not a joking God. So he was, he was moving fast. He said, you know what, oh, yeah, take Take your people, let them go. God has been asking, let my people go, and he keep holding them. It reached a point that he could not hold. He could not say, you know, I'm not, I'm not letting go. He said, by himself, when he saw what was happening, he started with even his own family was affected. He said, take, and, they, and he let them go. So not the blessing that one. So there were blessings that were attached to also this release. As they were leaving out, they were exiting. There were several blessings that were attached to it that associated with Israelite exodus. Number one. They left Egypt with all their personal effects. When the deliverance came forth and Pharaoh said, you know, you can go. I don't think he had the mind even to think that he's going to hold them anymore. He didn't even think of, you know, holding their property. They let say, take everything you want. Just take, go. The, first thing, the last thing he wanted to see was the Israel. He just said, go. Oh, yeah, go, take. Take your animals. Take your properties. Because now he was concentrating on what was going on. It was too late. Number two, there was a notable expression of divine favor to the Israelites, which means they were enriched with the spoils of Egypt. They carried everything. They carried everything even from, from Egypt. The Israelites enjoyed complete salvation, deliverance, and redemption since, since they were divinely helped to go with all of their young ones and all of their animals. They did not hold their children, they did not hold their animals, they released them with everything. That was a blessing. Pharaoh, under the strong hand of God, crushed out the Israelites out of Egypt as God had previously assured Moses. God had assured Moses, I will do it. So it reached a point that, you know, it came to pass. 
their exodus was the final fulfillment of God's long-awaited promise to Abraham. God had promised Abraham that he deliver his people. It was also, number six, it was also an accomplishment of his current promises of divine response to their cry and to him to put an end to their bondage in Egypt. Now, many of us here used to be in bondage. There are some of us that still find themselves in bondage. I don't know what bondage you find yourself in. I don't know what bondage you've been crying to God for years, for months, for days, for weeks, that you want God to deliver you from. As the children of Israel cried unto God for years, 430 years, is it your problem? Is it your bondage that you think God cannot bring you out? Today God is bringing and speaking, he's bringing a message to you and to me and to all of us that it does not matter what kind of bondage. If there's a bondage, there's sin that, God, that the devil has bind you in. It could be any kind of sin that God has, but it could be pride. It could be pride, it could be fornication, it could be adultery, whatever it is. It could be lying, it could be gossip, it could be slander backbiting. Whatever it is that does not please God in the form of sin. That bondage that you find yourself in. It could be generational curses that are hindering you from progressing in life. God is saying, I did it unto the children of Israel who are bound for 430 years. I can still do it because I'm still the same. I am Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, yesterday, same yesterday, today, and forever. He's calling you and I today. I don't know what you're going through. I know if you open your heart, Christ is available. The blood is available. If you speak this to, and to you, uh, plead the blood of Jesus and ask God, keep crying. He's saying, this is a day. This is a day of exodus. This is a day of deliverance. This is the day I want to push you out of your situation. This is the day I want to deliver you from that generational curse that has bound you for years, that has blocked your ways and blocks your blessing. Praise the Lord. If he did it unto the children of Israel, you and I, that has a better covenant with him through Jesus Christ who died on the cross, what else do you think that he cannot do for you and me? What else do you think that he can do not for you? The last uh, benefit was that the permanence of this blessing is expressed through God's demand that the memory of this event be preserved all through their generation. He was told, you know, he was told that, you know, share this with your children all over the and continue to celebrate it, not just once, but every year do it so it can remind, remind you of the goodness of God. Praise the Lord. I want to, because of time, I will not, I'm not going to be able to finish, but I want to just touch on the gratitude and then we pray. We have to be show gratitude to God for what God did, the blessing that came with the Passover. And now we look at our New, our new Testament, the Lord's Supper, the Passover that came through Jesus Christ. That we are supposed to be very grateful because if God did not go on the cross to die for us, where would we be? We would perish. The children of Israel showed their gratitude by offering their firstborns that were saved unto God as a sacrifice to serve God in holiness, to serve God, and God were going to use them to be the priests. We are the priesthood of this generation. So God is asking you, I show gratitude for what Christ did on the cross for you and I, that we, he may also see that you know what you appreciate, what you, we cannot continue to take our salvation for granted. We cannot continue to take the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for granted. And the children of Israel, as they went, they didn't know how they were going to go, but God led them. A man does not know their way. In fact, when I reached this point, I was kind of a little bit grieved, and I looked at how the way life is very difficult. The way life is very challenging. There is so many obstacles in this life that sometimes you wonder, how am I going to make it? Even in my own, in our own salvation, sometimes I wonder, say, we struggle a lot. Sometimes one day you are up, sometimes you are down. And I wonder, say, I've claimed Christ and Lord my Savior. I've pleaded the blood of Jesus, but I'm still struggling. But the Lord is saying that your ways, a man cannot know their way. Who can know their way? But we have to let God lead us by his spirit. We have to let his presence abide with us in order to find our way out. And as we continue following him, as we continue asking for help, he will help us even now and, and to the very end when we see Jesus, either during rapture or death should Jesus Christ study, and we'll be with him in eternity forever and ever. Amen? I want us to close our eyes and pray. I want us to thank God for this message. I want you I to tell God, thank you for bringing this message of deliverance, for pushing me out of my situation, for the bondages that the devil has bound me. The devil does not want anything good for a child of God. God has made your priesthood of this time, and that God is saying, my presence will abide with you if you allow me 
to let my presence allow. He says, anything that will miss, cause you not to have my presence is sin. What sin are you in? What sin are you dwelling in? What sin are you bound in? Tell God, have mercy upon me, Lord. I'm willing to change. I plead the blood of Jesus over everything that is in me that is not pleasing unto you. And I ask that you come and take over me. I ask that you lead me. I ask that you help me to live sinless. Even as I partake in the Lord's Supper, every time we are, we are opportune to do so, that God would be pleased with me. And that, that uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper is going to bring deliverance and healing and everything that we need in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, the reason you are seeing the projection of the person here is not that you can't see better <laughs> of the thing, but it's because uh, last week, you remember, you, we had a screen problem where you cannot even see anything on projection. So, but... Um, we tried to fix the issue over there, um, but we found out that there's an improvement, some call that we need to get. So it, it does, it refused to work in what was, uh, in the port it was working. We thought we got a new one, but it's still the same problem. But to fix it on the other type of equipment, it's working fine, but that equipment is only the one that projects to the people on Zoom. So you're actually seeing what people on Zoom are seeing, okay? Um, it's either you see that for now or you see blank. So we decided that you see that, all right? So please bear with us. So it's not that we want to project the person here. Amen? Praise the Lord. Um, uh, thank God for the side the scriptures. I am happy that you're here. Um, let me just see. You see, when I ask who studied this thing, it's for two reasons. I want to make sure that I encourage you to study, to be a student of the Bible, to study the Word of God. And even what is a $10 Chick-fil-A? It's just to, if it is, it's, for the, it's what we do for kids, you know, to sensitize them, to bribe them into doing something, not for adults. And when we do it for adults, we just want to do it for the fun of it. Praise the Lord. But if you did study this booklet, can I see your hand up? All right. If you did study, can I see your hand up again? All right. You see, brethren, I want to encourage you, okay? Um, the, there's no substitute to Christian maturity. There's no, uh, there's no other way you prove to me your commitment. It is by little things like this. You wake up in your morning. If I ask you, if I ask you now, if you had your quiet time throughout the week, Monday to Sunday, raise up your hand consistently. I'm not asking. I'm just. If I ask now, you know, a lot of people might not raise up their hand. Your Christianity is actually the one is mostly lived outside of the church. All right. So the quality of your Christianity is determined by the level and the time you spend with the Lord, his word and in prayer. Amen? And then the life that you live, all this equates to the quality. You can't fake it. You can't fake it. And even if you do, your spirit knows the truth and it's, the Lord knows the truth. The Lord will help you and I as we strive and struggle to make heaven at last in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, today is our GCK, GCK Sunday, and we have a lot. So we're going to be brief in a lot of the things that we say. I um, wanted to skip this, but let me ask the question because uh, some of the times we didn't ask all the questions during the teaching. What is your biggest take home? What's your biggest take home from the study today, please? Raise up your hand if you have a biggest something to contribute. Thank you. All right. Let me ask your question. Does anybody have a question from the study of today? Okay. Let me ask a question then. What sacrifice 
did God ask the Israelites to make before they left Egypt? You know, before they left Egypt, God asked them to make a sacrifice. What was that sacrifice that the Lord asked them to make? I need to see some hands up before they left Egypt. Yes, let's give to Papa, uh, Pastor C.Y., please. Um, Thank you very much. It was a simple instruction. Do this and you will live. Right? Um, you've been beaten by a serpent. There's a bruising serpent that is raised up. If you look at it, you will live. If you think the instruction is stupid, that why will a, a, a salvation come on a brazen serpent you, and you don't look, you will die. The same thing... God gave also a simple instruction. And the instruction that the Lord gave to the people of Israel was simple. Amen? The problem, um, electronics. All right. I don't think the people are seeing. Thank you. <laughs> you now know why I sometimes will tell that. Because sometimes they project that and forget. You know? Until, but I, I could see what the people on Zoom are seeing. So I'm, I'm happy you're able to see some of those things now. Thank you. So, and the Lord gave them a simple instruction. Kill the lamb, put the blood on the lintel, and if you do that, you will be saved. Remember that all the time, all the, in all the ten plagues, in most of the night plague, God never told the uh, the Israelites to do something. The target of the judgment was on the, Isra uh, uh, on the Egyptians, right? The hail, the frog, the swarm, the darkness, all the plagues was in a section. Why couldn't this last one also be? On that section, what God said, when the angel of destruction is passing, it's going to pass through the land of Egypt, including Goshen, where you live. Okay? Now, but the only way you are going to be exempted is by the blood. Amen? By the blood. Say by the blood. Your deliverance is by. The, your salvation is by. You know, my mother, if we are doing something, I, she's in the kitchen and she's cooking. The, the plate is falling. Say, that is, is the dead first daughter. She will call. And if she's in the accident and when she wants to, she will call the first daughter. I said, if she come, of what use is he going to do to you? You know, why would you be calling? Learn to call Jesus. Learn to call what? Jesus. I want you to call it. Where is your salvation? Jesus. Amen. And if you, you can also call the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. There is deliverance in that name. There is salvation in that name. They overcame him by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. And they put on that lintel. And the angel of that past, he had respect for the blood. Again, remember, if the blood of lamb and goats could save people, how much potent is the blood of Jesus? The eternal blood of the Son of God. The sacrifice that was done once and for all. You no longer need to go and make animal sacrifices. 
Because that blood of Jesus is as authentic uh, today as it was 2,000 years ago. Praise the Lord. And that blood, you can still call on the name of Jesus and the blood of the Lamb, and they will be effective. But you see, they will not be effective in the... Now, there's some differences in this blood of compared to the blood of Jesus. That blood that was put on the lintel is a temporal deliverance and salvation. It's a temporal. The blood of Jesus, as you hold on him, is an eternal salvation. Did you hear me? The blood of Jesus can save you within and without, can cleanse you and purge you and set you absolutely free. In fact, more than that, the, power, the blood of Jesus and the power in the name of Jesus makes you a carrier of the anointing and of the grace of God. Okay? Because that blood is not just a blood that is in, in, on the external lintel of the house. It's a blood that is an internal, and it's something that is personal, that is something that is done in the heart. And it lives within you. When the people of Israel left the house, remember when they went across the Red Sea, a lot of them died. What a, how, how effective was the blood on the lintel? It was temporal. It was temporal. In fact, everyone, upon all the millions that left Egypt, the only two people that ended up in the promised land after 40 years were just two. God made sure that everybody there, they didn't die one day, but within 40 years, you will hear this person died, had a heart attack. This person slept, didn't wake up. This person was, uh, a plague came, uh, whether it's called coronavirus, and took several people out. By the time, at the end of 40 years, only two people that started the journey ended it. Praise the Lord. You know, it's, it's very, very sad. But let's not play with God, amen? Let's not play with God. In fact, um, um, so that, that, that is something, when God gives us an instruction, even if it is hard, let's ask for the grace to do it. Did you hear me? God is willing to help us even in our weakness. Are you hearing? When, even when you think that God, something that God says, it is difficult for you to say, to do, just ask for his grace and wisdom and his direction and he will help you. The people, who, the, the problem is that we don't actually open up to God and tell him sincerely how difficult our struggles are. How We need to be very sincere and open to him. To let him know. And he will help us. I remember when I was growing up as a young Christian. And there was this woman that had, was started coming to church. I think she was either second, third wife. And you know, in the teaching of the word of God, God was saying, uh, look, if you sincerely came to know Jesus Christ, okay, and you discarded your first wife, because you saw a sweet sixteen, God expects you to do things right when you now come in. You need to go back and reconcile with your first wife. If you married five wives or four wives, the gate of heaven doesn't allow the multitude, won't enter all of you. You know? The gate of heaven will allow you one. Do you understand? And it's not easy for somebody who came to know but it's part of the cross. And Jesus said, him that will not take up his cross, the difficulty, and follow me, he's not going to be my disciple. So it's something you have to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, no matter how difficult the road might be. And But if that, womb, if that one will call and ask God, please, Lord, I don't know how to do it. I want to make heaven. I want to make heaven. 
Give me the grace to be able to do so. The Lord will help you. And the Lord will give you the grace to be able to do so in Jesus' name. Um, over the weekend, I, my, um, I was healed in thought of a very, very uh, wealthy man that died in London over the weekend. You know, and he's from my state. You know, and, and I was just thinking, this was a man. You know, in fact, I don't know if it is a, a, a recent video, but they were sharing in how when he got to London, his children and his wife, they came and he was videoing and they were just rejoicing, not knowing in a day or two he would be gone. You know, heart attack. But the point is this, and I was saying, wow. The imperial nature of life. What if God has asked him to do something that was so difficult? When he comes to God and God give me the grace, God will give him the enablement. Or what if he had said, I won't do it? God will let leave him. The same thing, God is appealing and has been appealing to you and I. To let, God and, to let go and to let God have his way. And I trust that God will help you and I so that heaven will bear us witness that we live for God in our lifetime in the name of Jesus. Uh, what is important for every believer to partake? Why is it important for every believer to partake in the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper, a lot of the time, a lot of our young people, when we are taking the Lord's Supper, they will just let it pass. That thing that is preventing you to, for taking the Lord's Supper will also prevent you from making heaven. If every time we are taking the Lord's Supper, you say, I'm on feet, I'm on feet, I'm a sinner. If you're a sinner, come to Christ. He will cleanse you. He will wash you. He will forgive you. Am I right? Okay. Uh -huh. You cannot claim that you're a sinner every day. If you're a sinner every day, that means if the rapture happens, you'll be left behind. Praise the Lord. So we cannot, if you're a sinner, repent. If you repent, you are worthy to take the, uh, to take the, uh, the, uh, the, the supper the Holy Communion. And if you are able to, if you've repented, you are able to make heaven. Praise the Lord. God doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that each and every one of us will come to know him in the name of Jesus. Why must we be grateful to God for delivering us from the enemy of our soul? By the way, are you even grateful? How do you show it? Our time is up, and I want us to pray. As I want you to talk to God. I want you to talk to God and say, Father, I don't want to be, uh, I want to live as a, a woman and a man with heart full of gratitude for all that you have been and all that you have uh, delivered me from. I appreciate the blood of Jesus I appreciate the name of Christ. I appreciate the blood that was shed on the cross for me. I appreciate the emancipation from the, uh, from the pit of hell. I mean, from uh, the damnation that awaits me. Lord, I am grateful, O oh God, that the blood has saved me and has covered me from a lot of unseen uh, demonic forces in my, uh, that hover to, 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 to deal with me. I am grateful for the name of Jesus. I am grateful for the, effect, the, the effectiveness of the blood of the Lamb. Father, I'm grateful. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you help me to live it out. Live out that life of Christ and victory that Lord has been given unto me by, in, in Christ. Thank you, Father, because I know you've had an answer. Jesus' name I pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you because, Lord, it is by the blood of Christ that, Father, judgment has passed over us. It is because 
When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Thank you, O God. Because when the enemy raises up their anger, all their, their, their tentacles on us, the Spirit of God raises up a standard against them and brings all their plans and purposes to naught in our life. Father, I, I thank you and I'm grateful for these great and amazing things that you have done in our life. Be thou exalted and praised, O God, in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, please let Jesus be in my mouth. Let Jesus be in our mouth. That Lord, the first name that we will call in the time of trouble will be the name of Jesus, will be the blood of the Lamb in the mighty name of Jesus. We know that that name and that blood is only as effective as our, as, our, as, our, as our life, our sinless life. We cannot be abusing you in lies and sins and then be using the name of Jesus. It will be of no value. Help us, O oh God, to do your will. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.